John 15, I'm going to read from the New King James, and I'll read, uh, let's start with verse 1 and read through verse 8. John 15, 1, New King James, Jesus speaking, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. So will you be my disciples. Now when you look at this setting, it seems to be quite an important teaching. This is shortly before Jesus was crucified. Some of the last teaching to his disciples. And notice that very last statement, so you will be my disciples. He is explaining how they will be disciples, particularly after Jesus has ascended to heaven. How are people going to be disciples? Now, we often think about converts. How do you become a convert? And I think we could all, or at least most of us, could give an answer uh, to how do you become converted? And of course, we know it's by faith in Jesus Christ, but there's a definite conversion experience. Repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's how you're converted. But the, how you're converted doesn't automatically translate into long-term commitment living for God. That is the process of becoming a disciple. So what we're talking about here is how to be a disciple. So that should be, I would hope, of interest to everyone tonight, or likely we wouldn't even be here to start with. I'm going to call this lesson, Bearing Spiritual Fruit. So let's start off, and I need you to help me out. Some, uh, I want to find out what Jesus is really talking about. Notice he says, I am the true vine. Jesus is the vine. Now, he's comparing spiritual life to a grapevine. And he says, my father is the vine dresser. Now, the, the vine dresser is the one who tends the vine. Now, let's think about who Jesus is. We know that Jesus Christ is God manifested in the flesh. In this passage, he's speaking of his human life that he is going to share with us. He's not really talking about multiple persons in the Godhead. That's not under discussion or under question. But he's speaking of himself in his earthly life and how we can partake of that life. Obviously, we're never going to become God. God is unique. God is one. No one is like God. No one is God's equal. God does not share his glory with another. We're not trying to become little gods, but we're trying to become disciples of Jesus Christ. So he's explaining that he, as a human being, it, it, how he relates to God, and that will become a model for how we relate to God. So, the Father, or God, the one true God, is the vine dresser. He is the one who plants and tends and, and gathers the fruit. Jesus is the vine. And then he goes on to say, we are the branches. We must always remember that our spiritual life exists only insofar as we are connected to Jesus Christ. Jesus is the source. Think of the grapevine. Uh, it, of course, from the roots uh, come the sustenance or nourishment to the entire plant. The branches bear the grapes, but the branches only bear grapes if they're connected to the vine. They've got to be connected to the trunk or the main source because they don't have an independent source of water and nutrition. They must get their water and nutrition through the vine. So it's foolish for us to think that we can create our own fruit. Now whatever fruit means, we'll discuss that in a little bit. 
But if you think of your spiritual life or spiritual productivity or good works or anything that you might think spiritual fruit would be, we as sinful human beings cannot produce spiritual fruit that is pleasing to God apart from our connection to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we can't be saved by our good works. Now, we could do a lot of good deeds. Um, even sinful people or people who are not saved, they can do lots of good deeds. But those good deeds do not enter the category of spiritual fruit. Because we bear spiritual fruit only as we're connected to the vine. Now, what would that mean to be connected to the vine? If Jesus is the vine and we are the branches... And then he says, if you're going to bear fruit, you must abide in me. To abide means to dwell or remain. So if you cut the branch, it may have life for another day or two. At least it appears to have life. In other words, the, the, uh, the leaf might be green for another few hours. But over time, it cannot sustain itself. And so the fruit will wither and the leaf will wither because it's no longer connected to the source. So he says not merely you must have had an experience with me. You must have been converted at one particular time. He said you must abide in me. It speaks of relationship. Now we as Pentecostals, we're oriented to experience and that's good and right as i said before there are definite experiences a time when we repent of our sins we turn away from sin we turn to god there's a definite time where we're baptized in jesus name we can take you to the place and time and tell you when it happened we there's a time where we received the holy ghost we spoke in tongues we can tell you when and where that happened there are definite experiences in our christian life at the, the outset that brings us into this relationship. But discipleship is more than one-time experiences. Or more than just going back to an experience. But it issues forth in a new life. Abiding, dwelling, remaining. So how do we as branches abide in the vine? Well, what would you say? How do we abide in Christ? Somebody help me out here. I presume that someone has an idea. I hope. Yes. Living by faith. All right. Someone else. Partaking of the word of God. Prayer life. Staying in church. The word is not only what you read, but spoken word. And I would say not only just the word, but fellowship. When we say staying in church, uh, that's a big subject in itself because we are part, you know, we're part of the body of Christ, to use another illustration that the Lord uses. We're not in isolation, but when we're connected to Jesus, we're connected to everyone else. And we can't be disconnected from everyone else, and, but yet still connected to Jesus. Now... Somebody might listen to a radio program or watch a television program and get some, some uh, spiritual insight or some scriptural truth. But that is no substitute for being in church. Because it's more than information transmission. It's abiding. It's fellowship. It's, you can pray alone, but praying by yourself uh, while that accomplishes some important things that nothing else can substitute for, yet the corporate prayer and worship also sustains us in a way that we cannot do solely on our own. So abiding in Christ would include abiding with the body of believers, being connected to one another. Any other thoughts on what it means to abide in Christ? Pardon? Doing good work. It's so, so not just showing up and sitting on the pew, but actually being a participant, taking a part, being active. All right? Well, that's, that's good. So we need to understand that discipleship is about abiding. It's more than about a, a certain experience. It's more than about certain head knowledge. It's more than about 
uh, certain doctrines that you believe. I'm not discounting the importance of all those things. But abiding indicates an ongoing relationship, a communion, uh, a, a, a communication back and forth between the Lord and us, and communication back and forth with God's people. We cannot sustain a mature spiritual life without that abiding process. Amen. All right. Let's think about that then. And so if we neglect these things that cause us to abide, just like the branch that's cut off, it may not be immediately apparent. But over time, it will become evident that we are no longer connected to the source of life. Now, he says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now, what would it mean to bear fruit? If we are connected, then what is the Lord looking for when he says fruit? Souls. All right. Stewardship. Okay, anything else? Fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, as, uh, for example, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. All right. Anyone else? Humility. Okay. I think the spiritual fruit, we should not look at it in a one-dimensional sense, but in a holistic sense. Certainly, it would be souls. I mean, we think of fruit as more people coming into the kingdom of God. But I don't think we can exclusively isolate that because your spiritual life uh, for example in Acts chapter 1 Jesus said that you will be witnesses after you receive the Holy Spirit you will be witnesses for me to be a witness certainly would involve standing up and saying something but doesn't it have to mean more than that because if you stand up and say Jesus Christ save me and he wants to save you too, okay, that's witnessing. But if our lives are full of sin, and we're bound by those habits of sin, then what kind of witness are we? You know, our life is inconsistent with our speech, and what are people going to believe? They're going to believe what they see in our lives. So if we say, Jesus Christ saves people, but I happen to be bound myself, what kind of witness is that? So I think to choose either or is a mistake. To say witnessing is just talking to people about the Lord, that's not accurate. Because if you don't have a consistent life, you're not a good witness. On the other hand, if you live a good life but you never talk to the, about, about the Lord to other people, that doesn't make sense either because there's got to be an overflow. I mean, if there is a spiritual life, part of that is sharing. Part of that is loving. If you really do love souls, then you can't ignore them. I would say the same thing about spiritual fruit. I do believe it involves winning more souls into the kingdom of God. But you can't just look at that only. Well, how many Bible studies did you teach? Or how many people did you witness to today? Or how many people did you share your testimony with today? That itself is not the sole determinant of spiritual fruit. Because we're looking for an, a, 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 a fruit is something that's produced. And so just, I would say, witnessing in the sense of verbal witness is more like scattering seed. And while that's legitimate and necessary, seed, scattering its seed itself is not producing fruit. The seed could be thrown on stony ground. You know, I could go out to Walmart and raise up a sign and say, repent or perish. Be baptized in Jesus' name or go to hell. And I can count, you know, 250 people saw that sign. So I bore 250 pieces of fruit. So I'm a superior Christian. But if my method doesn't win anybody, and in fact maybe turns people off, I actually might not have any fruit. So just verbally witnessing, or even successfully winning someone in itself, may be part of the production of spiritual fruit. That's not the whole story. It seems like that a consistent Christian life and bearing, um, having good works, good deeds, having a transformed life, 
having love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faith, uh, gentleness, meekness, temperance, all those things would also be spiritual fruit. In fact, uh, Galatians 5, 22 through 23 explicitly says the fruit of the Spirit. So I believe we shouldn't limit the application of this passage to simply how many souls did you win, nor should we limit the application of this passage to, to how much love and joy and peace do you have. I think it's all of the above. It's discipleship. It's a mature Christian life. Now, having said that, notice, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And then go down to verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. They gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. So, here's the first condition of the potential disciple. No fruit. What is the result of no fruit? Well, the end is destruction. It indicates no connection with the vine. And the end result is destruction, judgment. That indicates that someone could come into the church. Someone could repent, be baptized, be filled with the Spirit, but not abide. And if they do not abide, they will, do not, they will not produce fruit. If they do not produce fruit, they will be condemned in the end. So that's a dangerous place to be. Now notice, and let's be careful, this does not mean we're saved by works. It does not mean we can total up my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds so I deserve to go to heaven. Notice, if you bear fruit, it's simply because you are connected to the vine. He said, without me, you can't do anything. It will be foolish to boast of our good works or our good deeds because the source of anything good that we do and any spiritual fruit is the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not a matter of us totaling up our good deeds and turning it into the Lord and saying, hey, I deserve to get into heaven because look at all the good things I've done. That's not the point at all. That would be to get things reversed. We're not saved by works, we're saved by faith. But the point of it is, faith is a relationship. And that relationship will bear fruit. If it doesn't bear fruit, that indicates something's wrong somewhere. Something's stopped up. Uh, you're not getting the, 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 the nourishment from the vine. Something is blocked. There's a disease, there's a fungus, or you've been cut off. So the point is not that you earn your way to heaven by works. The point is, check your relationship of faith. Because if you do have that relationship, there will be the natural production of fruit. And that's why this analogy of fruit is so good. You know, if you have an apple tree that uh, doesn't have any apples on it, then it's really, it's really not fulfilling its purpose. Now, if you go buy five apples and you nail them to the tree... You have not thereby produced a productive tree. Especially if it's a, a lemon tree. And you go nail some apples on it. You have not really accomplished anything. You know, by its nature, fruit is not something you buy or you manufacture or you make up. Fruit is something that has to develop naturally. So this analogy of fruit shows you it's not salvation by works. It's not something you produce. It's not something you buy. It's not something you earn. It's not something artificially acquired and imposed on you. It has to come from within. It has to be a growth process. It has to come from the work of the Spirit. It has to come from your relationship with Jesus Christ. So uh, really thinking about the fruit analogy shows it's not our works that save us. It's our relationship. But here's the point. If your relationship doesn't bear any results, something's wrong. And some people misunderstand James. You know, Paul said we're saved by faith, not by our works. And James says, well, you say you have faith without works. I have, I'll show you my faith by my works. So James is not contradicting Paul. He's just saying, look, the kind of faith that saves you is the kind of faith that produces results. So if you never see any results, you better go back and check your faith. 
Brother Paul is right when he says you're saved by faith. But what kind of faith are you talking about? A mere verbal profession? A mere agreement to a list of doctrines? No, you're misunderstanding Paul. What the kind of faith that Paul is talking about is the kind of faith that changes your life and we can see the difference. So if you can't see the difference, that should let you know you haven't really entered into that relationship or you've somehow fallen away from that relationship or you're not letting the Spirit flow in your life. So go back and check the flow. Make sure you're abiding. So the first position is no fruit. Now it's interesting, even though the result of that is judgment, God is so merciful and gracious, he doesn't just immediately cast us away. Notice, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. So there is definitely a, a disciplinary process. But notice in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 through 6, which in turn is a quotation from the book of Psalm, uh, Proverbs. But Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. So when the Lord sees that we're not bearing fruit, he will discipline us. Instead of immediately casting us off permanently, he will discipline us. He will chasten us. He will scourge us to get us to the point where we understand I'm not in relationship with God as I need to be. While none of us likes trials, trials do have a way of causing us to cry out to God. And so trials can be very effective in causing us to go back to that relationship. And as a result of that, we start bearing fruit. Now, notice this. What if, so if you are in the position of no fruit, you will be chastened by the Lord. You will be disciplined by the Lord. So, if you are in a position of being chastened or disciplined, you ought to ask, am I bearing fruit? If not, the Lord may be dealing with me. Instead of railing against God, instead of fighting the trial and trying to to deal with the symptoms, you know, trying to solve the problems on my own, maybe I need to go back to God and say, Lord, you help me. And maybe the Lord's way of helping is to get you to change some things that you're doing so that you'll start bearing fruit. So the first situation that a Christian might find himself or herself in is not bearing fruit. In that case, you're not going to be a disciple very long. And if you stay in that condition, in the end, you'll be destroyed. So the solution, God's solution, if you're not bearing fruit, is to chasten you or discipline you. So don't despise God's discipline. He's trying to get you to bear fruit. He's trying to get the, the sap flowing. And if he has to send some winds to blow, to loosen you up, he may just do that. But now, this is what's interesting. The second position that a Christian might be in Notice verse 2, every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now, think about this. You're finally starting to grow as a Christian. You've gone through some trials. You failed a few times and you learned from your mistakes and You've asked God to deliver you, and you've been set free from certain temptations and certain habits of sin. You're finally growing. You're finally developing. You're finally maturing. You start bearing some fruit. So you're starting to feel pretty proud of yourself. Hey. But guess what? The Lord has bigger plans in mind. The Lord sees more potential in you than you see in yourself. So you're ready to coast. You're saying, hey, I've got two little apples this year on my tree. Hey, that's pretty good. For five years, there weren't any apples. Now I have two. I, I'm okay. I've arrived. And the Lord says, you can do a lot better than that. So when you bear fruit, he prunes you so you can bear more fruit. 
Now, I'm not a gardening expert, but some of you help me out here. Isn't it true that if you want to have more roses on the bush, you have to prune it? Isn't it true that if you want to have more fruit on the tree, you have to prune it? There's something about cutting away the excess, cutting away the non-productive, or cutting away what's already produced and won't produce again, it forces the sap into those areas that are still capable of producing. So if you don't prune, the nutrition gets wasted on areas that are non-productive or already past production. Whereas if you prune those areas, then you force the tree to concentrate on areas of potential growth and productivity. Now you don't have to raise your hand, but have you ever felt that way? That just when you're finally doing some things right, it seems like you're getting pruned. You say, now Lord, if I was fighting against you, I could understand that you would chasten me. But I'm finally doing something right. Shouldn't you just let me have it easy for a while? Shouldn't you just let me coast for a few years? Can't you get, make everything so all my bills are paid and everybody loves me and nobody offends me when I come to church, everybody pats me on the back? I mean, should, couldn't you give me a couple years of a break? Seems like just when I'm finally doing good, somebody at church says something that offends me and somebody in my family does a crazy thing and this and that. And the Lord says, I'm pruning you. I'm trying to get rid of those attitudes I'm trying to test you in areas that maybe you didn't realize and so that you'll work on those because I see the potential for more fruit. I see a great Christian in the making. I'm not satisfied with a mediocre disciple. I'm not satisfied with someone who's just trying to get by with the least course of resistance. But I'm challenging you to be what I have called you to be. I see great things in your future. You can win many souls, but you can't win many souls with a bad attitude or a prickly personality. So I've got to chop some things off. I've got to refine you. I've got to sand you. I've got to prune you so that you'll bear more fruit. So category one is no fruit. You get discipline to bear fruit. Category two is you're bearing fruit you get pruned so you bear more fruit. And the process, I would imagine pruning is not painless, but it's productive. And then notice the third, the third category in verse 8. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. There's the goal. He wants you to bear fruit. And in fact, if you don't, you're not going to last. He wants you to bear more fruit, not just get by with the minimum. But then if you are bearing more fruit, his goal for you is to bear much fruit. And how can you bear much fruit? Well, it seems if you abide in him. The more you abide. So don't try to get by with the least amount of prayer that you can get. You know, you could wake up and say, well, I don't feel too good. If I skip one Sunday, I'm not going to go to hell. I mean, surely, would God send you to hell because you missed one Sunday of church? Surely not. But that's not the issue. That's not the point. You know, I hear, hear people say, well, is it a hell or hell issue? heaven or hell issue? You can't reduce everything to a heaven or hell issue. Like the, the analogy I just gave. Do I really think if somebody woke up and they're just kind of feeling tired, so I think I'll skip Sunday, you, you, if the rapture came to you, do I think they would go to hell? No, probably not. But do I think it's the will of God for him to slack off? No, absolutely not. It's the will of God for them to get up and go to church and reap the benefit. And be part of the process. It's kind of like, do I have to eat supper? Will I die if I don't eat supper? Well, no, you won't die. You can skip. Okay. So how long can I skip before I die? Well... Some people have fasted 40 days, so I suppose you could fast 40 days. But, I mean, how many of us really say, well, I think I'll just skip supper 40 days just because, you know, I don't have to do it. I can live without it. That's not the point. It's everything is not a life or death decision. Do everything we do is because it's a life or death decision? No. 
We do most decisions are not life or death. 99% of what we do in life is not because it's life or death, it's because it's what's good for us. It's because we're trying to bear fruit, much fruit, more fruit and much fruit. So I think I'll skip work today. If I skip work, I probably won't lose my job. Or if I do, I can get another one. Or if I can't get a job, I can go on welfare and get food stamps. I'm not going to die. Is that the way we make our decisions? No, we make our decisions on what's most productive. While it's true, if I skip work today and maybe tomorrow and maybe next week, I might not die from it. But it's not a smart thing to do. It's not a productive thing to do. The same way with living for God. Well, can I get away with this? Can I get away with that? What if I wear this? What if I don't wear this? What if I do this? What if I don't do that? Is it going to send me to hell? What a miserable way to evaluate your spiritual life. Instead, I challenge you to evaluate spiritual decisions on the basis of fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. And while it may not be a matter of heaven or hell, if you don't bear any fruit, it does seem to be a matter of heaven or hell. But while it may not be a matter of heaven and hell, whether you bear fruit, more fruit, or much fruit, it's obvious what the will of God is. He wants you to bear much fruit. Why would you settle for less than God's will? Why would you settle for less than God's best? Why would you settle for a mediocre, miserable existence on planet Earth when you could be a man of God, a woman of God, who can be a lighthouse to your neighborhood, can be... Can be a great person in the kingdom of God. And I don't mean you become famous. I mean your life can count. You can make a difference. You can defeat the devil on your own territory. You can win souls for God. You can change lives. And it goes back to what I was saying before I, I started my lesson. Over the years I've seen people who personally live for God. And I thought personally they were saved. But I've seen them make foolish, unwise, inconsistent, undisciplined decisions that had ramifications on their children. And while when their children became adults, they were accountable to God for their own choices. You could draw a connection between the person's inconsistent, lackadaisical spiritual life and the effect on their children. So why would you say, I can get by, I'm still saved. But look what you're doing in the process. You're destroying the fruit that God wants to give you. Look, not only your children, but your friends, your neighbors, the people you encounter, people you don't even know, people in Austin that are lost. What kind of fruit could you bear if your goal was to bear fruit, more fruit, much fruit? And so we make our decisions, we should, on the basis of, am I bearing fruit? If I am... Am I willing to bear more fruit? And if I am, am I willing to bear much fruit? And that's what the Lord says is his will. Notice verse 8. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So will you be my disciples. That's what a disciple really is. Not someone who's merely trying to escape hell. Trying to calculate, how can I get a passing grade so I don't go to hell? But the disciple is someone who says, how can I glorify the Lord? How can I bear much fruit? And that means, how can I touch lives and win people to the Lord? It also means, how can I display the love of God in an unloving world? How can I display the, display the joy of the Lord? In a joyless environment. How can I demonstrate the peace of God. In a disturbed and sorrowful world. And go down the list of the spiritual fruit of Galatians. And other passages of scripture. That are parallel. That's what a disciple does. How can I be. An example of Jesus Christ. How can my life bear. The fruit. That God wants me to bear. I want to bear fruit. But once I start bearing. I want to bear more fruit. And once that occurs, I want to bear much fruit. And I don't know exactly how it will all play out in the judgment. But 1 Corinthians 3 talks about, and this switches analogies, but it talks about the judgment seat of Christ. It talks about the believers who will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And some of them, their works will be tested. It's not a judgment of salvation. It's a judgment of their works. And some that had works of wood, hay, and stubble 
Their, their works will be tested by fire. So those that had works of wood, hay, and stubble, that will be destroyed. Those that had works of gold and silver and precious stones, their works will remain. Because it's not affected by fire. Indicating there will be people who are saved, who entered to heaven. But 99% of what they did in this world was strictly for themselves. Strictly for their own existence. In eternity, they have very little to show for it. Whereas others, the vast majority of their time was spent doing the things of God. And yes, they had to work on a job to eat. And yes, they had to do their regular daily business to survive. But their true motive was to bear fruit for God's kingdom. And so in the judgment, the evidence of their work will be there. The souls that they won will be there. The children that they raised will be there. The prayers that they prayed, the effects of all those prayers will be there. And no doubt the Lord will be able to trace, here is answer prayer number one. Here is answer prayer number two. This person over here is an answer to your prayer. This situation over here was worked out because of your prayer. So in the judgment, I mean, some may say, well, I'll just be glad to escape hell. But is that enough to base your eternity on? Or don't you want to say, what, don't you want to be able to look around and say, my prayers, my faith, my giving, my time, my money, my energy. Look at the results. Look at what we have to show for it. It won't be a matter of pride, but it'll be a matter of thankfulness. Because after all, we only produce as we're connected to the vine. But still, our will is involved because we have to let the work of God go onward. We have to abide. It's not automatic. That abiding is a choice that we make. So I'm challenging all of us here tonight. The will of God for each of us is to bear spiritual fruit. Don't be content with no fruit. If you are, you won't make it. But don't be content with the minimal amount of fruit. But press on in the will of God to bear more fruit. And to bear much fruit. And that's what it means to be a disciple. Let's stand together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Can we just open our heart and say, Lord, use me according to your will. Lord, mold me and make me. Help me to bear fruit. If you have to discipline me, please do that. I don't want the alternative. If you need to prune me, I go ahead. I give you permission to prune me because I know it will always be for my good. It will never be for my harm. So, Lord, I ask that you mold me after your will. That you make me into a vessel of service in the kingdom of God. Let's make the consecrations the Lord is calling us to make here tonight. Let's open our heart to the Lord. Lord, I want to be a disciple. Lord, I want to be a vessel. Lord, I want to be used of you. Lord, I want to have a place in your kingdom, but more than just a place. I want to bear fruit. I want to be productive. I want to be a true disciple that brings glory to the Father. Hallelujah.